everyone and thank you for joining us today to take a second look at the new rules for posted workers in the EU. My name is Annie and I will be facilitating this session for you today. So today's presentation will be given by a set of panelists who are all lawyers in different youth laborious firms. We have lawyers from Belgium, Italy, the UK, Hungary, Poland and Estonia joining the panel. Okay, we are then ready to start. I'm turning over to our moderator, Sophie Maas from Belgium. Go ahead, Sophie, you're welcome to start. Um, yes, hello, everybody. Um, it's Sophie from Brussels here. Um, also, for my behalf, uh, welcome on this webinar about the new rules of uh, regarding posted workers in the EU. Uh, new rules uh, because the European member states had to implement by the 30th of July 2020 the revised uh, posted workers directive. Um, second look, uh, because in September we already had a look at some local implementation in seven other jurisdictions, among which um, the Netherlands, France, Germany, Belgium and so forth. And we thought it would be interesting to also have a look how other jurisdictions have done this. So this is the reason why today I have a new set of countries uh, with uh, whom I will discuss uh, the uh, changes. So who do we have here today in our panel? Well, today, and I'm going to go like this, um, I'm going to start with Italy. I have uh, my colleague uh, Valeria. Um, then we go to the UK uh, with uh, Abby, and of course, Abby, I'm very sorry, but in two months before Brexit, I also need to ask you some things about Brexit. Um, then we will go a bit more Eastern Europe with bit Michael from Poland, and then also Henrietta from uh, Hungary, and then we go up north to Estonia uh, with uh, Haley. Um, yes, perhaps Annie, if you can now turn on the slides. Yes. Um, so today we're going to talk about the posted workers directive and more in particular the revised posted workers directive. So first of all, by, by way of introduction, uh, what is it? Um, posting, well actually posting means is a situation uh, where an employee is employed by a company, by his home employer, and he is seconded by his employer to another country, to another member state, to uh, temporarily work there in that other member state in the host country for his home country employer. So what is very important here is that the employee does not enter into service with a local company in the host company. Now, the question that then comes up is what law applies to that employee while he's working under his home country employment contract in the host country? Well, first of all, and that is another tool we have on European level, it's the Rome 1 regulation says, because this is a temporary situation, we will not change the applicable law. Employment contract continues to be governed by the home country employment laws. Um, but as we all know, there are serious uh, differences between employment laws, employment protections, uh, between the different uh, member states. And that is why in 96 there has been a correction uh, that has been uh, introduced by the Posted Workers Directive in order to avoid social or reduce social uh, dumping, also to make sure to ensure a fair competition uh, between companies located in uh, different uh, member states of the EU by the, the Posted Workers Directive and by namely saying uh, that when an, a worker is posted to another country based on Rome 1 regulation, very good, your employment contract continues to be governed by the home country employment laws, but that does not say that you do not need to comply with a hardcore a minimum terms of conditions of the host country that also also apply just in, in order to make sure uh, that we have this delicate balance of the freedom of services on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, protection of employees and the fight against uh, social dumping. So it's something that dates back from uh, 96. 
Uh, but what we have seen was that in practice, there were uh, too many differences uh, between the member states in the way they have implemented. And that is why in 2018, we have the revised posted workers directive, which has enhanced uh, the uh, enforced the protection uh, of employees. And it's that that member states so those changes um, that member states had to implement uh, by the 30th July of this year. So if we can now move to uh, the next slide. So if we then compare the revised posted workers directive compared with the original uh, posted workers directive of 96, uh, then we can fairly say that there has been changes in six areas. And we will just, you see them on the slides. It's an extension of the hardcore provision in the host country. It's uh, some provisions regarding CBAs, some provisions regarding uh, cost allowances. There is, has also a new uh, concept of long-term postings uh, that have been introduced and also some information uh, obligations. So these are actually the, the six main areas of changes uh, that have been uh, introduced by the revised posted workers directive and which we will discuss in uh, more uh, detail. Um, it's important also to know that at this moment, all the changes do not yet apply to the road transport sector. They apply in all other sectors, but not in the road uh, transport sectors because uh, Europe wants to develop a proper set of rules uh, for that sector. Um, the way the uh, revised posted workers directive uh, has been um, uh, established or has been drafted was not a, an easy exercise because uh, the, the European member states, there were huge differences in views of what had to be changed. And in particular, um, I'm thinking about Hungary and Poland, they were, were very much against this. And I think Henrietta, you have some updates because Hungary has even started um, litigation against the revised posted workers directive. Perhaps if you can, by way of introduction, give us a little uh, insight on where we are now in that case uh, before the European uh, Court of Justice. Henrietta? Mm -hmm. Henrietta? <laughs> okay, perhaps we can discuss uh, Henrietta's view uh, later. Um, I suggest we uh, move uh, further. So to the next slide, uh, what you will see uh, there is that what we have done on the 30th of July within uh, Youth Laboris is a research or survey uh, amongst the members to know what is now the status of implementation uh, of the revised posted workers directive. And uh, we made a map out of it, and it's even available on our website, on the Youth Laboris website, on our uh, global mobility dashboard. And it's very easy to use because you see uh, what we have done is we have colored in the darker green the countries uh, that have implemented already uh, the revised posted workers directive. And there are, at this point in time, quite a lot of countries, uh, member states that have already done so. Um, and then you have the lighter greens. There are four countries like Portugal, Finland, Croatia, and Romania, who are in the status they have draft uh, legislation, but has not yet fully uh, adopted. And then you have the dark gray ones like Spain and Austria, who are uh, who do not uh, yet have uh, any kind of uh, legislation at this point in time. So if you want to have more details, I invite you and perhaps uh, Anna, you can go to the next slide. Uh, now you, you see where you can find it uh, on our global mobility dashboard. It's very easy to use. You just have to click on the country and you can find more details um, about it. So if we now have a look at uh, the country uh, specifics with uh, the main uh, slides. Um, so as I said, we have, and we can move to the next slide. Um, as I've said, so we have categorized them in uh, five uh, areas. Um, and the first one is this extension of the hardcore provision of the host country. So these are the minimum terms and conditions um, that uh, 
uh, also apply on posted workers when they temporarily work in the host country, even if their employment contract is, continues to be governed by the home country employment laws. So what has changed in, in relation uh, to that hardcore, according to the revised posted workers directive, is in uh, at first instance, and that is the most important one, I guess, is the, this concept, the concept of remuneration because it was really the purpose of the revised posted workers directive to make sure that there is a principle of equal pay for equal work at the same place. So it's really the purpose that posted workers should receive the same salary for the same work as uh, local uh, workers uh, receive in the host country. So the change here is that under the 96 posted workers directive, it was only relating to the minimum rates of pay, where but now this has been broadened in a concept that the remuneration must not only include the minimum rates of pay, but all mandatory elements of pay. So it goes much further. It can also include uh, mandatory premiums like a 31 premium, et cetera, et cetera. Be it that what is considered as remuneration, what must be included in as uh, mandatory elements elements of remuneration is something that each host country must determine uh, for its own uh, jurisdiction. So that is a very important uh, change. Um, another change that has been made, perhaps a bit uh, less important or to be determined according to jurisdiction, is that before it was stated that uh, posted workers are entitled to annual holidays according uh, to the host country, well, annual holidays has been uh, replaced by the minimum annual leave, which in some countries may perhaps be a bit more broader than just uh, the annual uh, holidays. Other thing that has been added is that if the employer pays for accommodation uh, for the employee for posted workers while the employee works in the host country. Well, if that accommodation is provided, it must comply with the standards of the host uh, country. And then finally, what has also been brought it in that hardcore is um, the allowances and expenses that are uh, reimbursements of expenses that are provided in uh, the host country in relation to reimbursement of travel, board and lodging, lodging that local workers, for example, uh, receive if they have to travel from their normal uh, place of work in the host country to another place of work in the host country, or if they from the host country are being assigned, assigned to uh, another place abroad. So what is important here is that it does not concern the travel from the home country to the host country. No, it concerns these reimbursements, these allowances, which are provided at host country level and which concerns movement once the posted um, uh, workers are within the host uh, country. So if something is provided for the local workers, then they, uh, they should also be paid to the um, uh, to the posted workers. So that is in a nutshell what has been extended uh, in terms of hardcore uh, provisions at the level of the posted workers directive itself. So now I'm very curious to go to uh, the panel and uh, also to have their comments uh, or their key considerations, uh, key points that we must consider um, um, when posting workers, for example, to Italy in terms of, I think also remuneration is an important uh, concept uh, here. Uh, Valeria, if you can give us some insights on that. Well, thank you very much, Sophie. Yes, I have to say, surprisingly, this time Italy is complying quite strictly with uh, the provisions of the directive because other times Italy has implemented in very original way uh, the directive. This time uh, we stick basically to what is provided in the directive and I just want to make a comment. So first, uh, this extension of the hardcore provisions of course is one of the most relevant aspects of the directive. And in practice, for instance, switching from uh, minimum rates of pay to remuneration, and it is the equivalent uh, in the Italian implementation, is a relevant change because remuneration is a much broader uh, concept. And especially if you take into account that uh, among uh, minimum conditions, uh, you need to consider also those who come from the collective agreements. In that moment, and this is a very practical point, you need to consider the items 
of remuneration that can be provided in the collective agreements. So, so this is a very practical point and a very relevant one uh, in terms of uh, you know, meaning of the changes. And the same for the holidays or leaves or days off. In Italian, I mean, is, is, the implementation is similar in terms of language. And again, holiday is a much more precise word while days off or leaves is, is much broader. So you may need to look into the collective agreements and see what is provided locally uh, because you may find many other items to be considered. Okay, thank you, Valeria. And Abby in the UK. Yes, hi everyone. Um, so the position in the UK is basically as it's set out um, on the slide. Um, but just as a little bit of background, the UK actually didn't pass any implementing legislation for the original posted workers directive, because it considered that UK law already provided the required amount of protection. Um, and in short, to all intents and purposes, the relevant rights and protections under UK law just apply by default to those who are working in Great Britain. And, and actually those rights and protections are sometimes found to apply to those working outside Great Britain as well in certain circumstances. Um, so for posted workers, the default assumption should always be that UK employment law applies um, in full. Um, so my comment for this point is probably going similar to my comments for most of the other points, um, aside from the fact that we have implemented some legislation in relation to the, the revised directive um, regarding temporary workers, which I'll mention later. Hey, thank you, Abby. Uh, Michael in Poland. Um... Hello, everybody. So as for uh, Poland, we follow the directive in terms of remuneration. So we replace the notion of the minimum salary with the notion of remuneration for work, which is a very broad sense and covers all the compulsory elements stipulated by the Polish law. So example would be allowance for night work, remuneration for overtime, as well as um, allowance for work uh, during the public uh, holidays. Um, what's also important, we can't compare these elements one by one, but we compare the entire salary and we see, we check in this way whether it's, uh, you know, it's, it fits the law. Mm, so in this way, um, we were the, the the notion given in the directive were, were implemented, and currently you have to look very broad when it comes to um, marking the exact remuneration that posted employee should have. Um, thank you, Michael. Annie, we can move to the next slide now. Thank you, um, Henrietta. I hope in the meantime. We can hear I you. Hope so. oh, cool. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sophie. And uh, just to, uh, to supplement the first slide. So, um, yes, uh, Hungary uh, uh, initiated uh, uh, an action for amendment of, uh, of the directive in 2018. And uh, this is still uh, in process, uh, but uh, Hungary also implemented uh, the uh, uh, posted uh, workers directive uh, 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 until the, the given deadline. Uh, so you can see on this slide a quite long list uh, uh, about the uh, mandatory uh, elements of pay. Um, and um, so these are uh, actually the uh, minimum payments uh, set out in the labor code and the uh, sectoral collective bargaining agreements if such agreements exist. Um, but important is uh, that this uh, uh, mandatory uh, elements of pay uh, must be uh, granted uh, from day one for all posted uh, workers in, in Hungary. Uh, and, uh, but I would like to, uh, to emphasize that these uh, uh, Hungarian rules are only applicable when uh, those are more favorable uh, for the employees uh, that the payment rules uh, of the home country. Okay, thank you. And then last, um, Estonia, Heli. 
Yes, uh, the Estonian implementation was also very similar. So we uh, replaced the earlier reference to minimum pay to simply pay. So meaning that also uh, other types of pay are now included, such as overtime, night work, work on public holidays, on-call duty, and also the reimbursements for the business trip cost was added uh, for the posted workers as well, which wasn't included before. Okay, thank you. Um, so this was the first uh, topic. So the second uh, topic of area where we had changes now is in relation to the uh, collective bargaining agreements. Um, under the original posted workers directive, um, the uh, collective bargaining agreements, which are declared universally binding, were only applicable to posted workers directive in the construction sector. So now what has, but that is at the level of the uh, posted workers directive, because it has to be said that in many countries, they already implemented it in a way that it applied to all sectors, but that was not in all jurisdictions. And that is why uh, now in the revised posted workers directive says that in all sectors, all CBAs also apply to uh, posted uh, workers. Um, so now I'm um, um, interesting to know uh, from the panel, uh, what do we mean by collective bargaining agreements? What kind of collective bargaining agreements are considered or are covered uh, if, in, uh, if um, employees are being posted to your uh, jurisdictions? Valeria in Italy? Yes, uh, thank you, Sophie. Uh, this is actually a very interesting point uh, because if we wanted to discuss, we could discuss about this uh, for, for long. Because uh, as a matter of fact, in Italy, collective agreements are not universally binding as a rule. So we know that as a matter of fact, in compliance with the law, employers could not apply a collective agreement. So they are not universally ap applicable or binding. However, uh, concerning the implementation of the directive, since the beginning, the, the impl Italian implementation of the directive made reference to the collective agreement as a valid source uh, concerning the minimum terms and conditions to apply to posted workers. In this specific in implementation, the last one of the last directive, there is an additional point that is the exclusion of the plant level collective agreement. So again, as a rule, collective agreements remain a source you need to look into when you need to assess which terms and conditions of employment need to apply uh, for the core provisions, uh, but not those coming from the plant level agreement. So all the national, but also not just national, territorial, local agreements, but not the plant level ones. So this is uh, interesting. The UK? Um, so not much to say here. We haven't um, implemented anything in relation to this, um, but um, in any event, um, collective bargaining agreements are not widely used in the UK in the same way as I know they are in other jurisdictions. So, for example, we have no sort of universally binding uh, sort of industry level or national level CBAs anyway. OK, thank you, Abby. Poland, what kind of CBAs do we look at? So Poland is only uh, one of a few EU countries that doesn't really have universally binding CBAs on the uh, national level. So uh, generally applicable terms and conditions of employment are only regulated in the form of act. So uh, it makes posting to Poland a bit, at, at least at this point, a bit less complicated than to the other um, uh, countries. Uh, so um, the employer that is posting employees to Poland has only looked into the act. Okay, and in Hungary? In Hungary, uh, only the CBAs are applicable uh, uh, based on the, the labor code. So this is the uh, in Hungarian implementation of the directive, which uh, CBAs uh, have been uh, extended to all employers uh, in a given sector. Uh, and uh, such CBAs uh, being currently in force are in the construction, hospitality and tourism, and in the electricity industry. 
so it also means uh, that the, the local uh, CBA, so which relates uh, to, to one entity, uh, which are not extended to all employers uh, in this sector, these are not applicable based on the Hungarian law. Oh, thank you, Henrietta. And then finally, Estonia. Yeah, uh, in Estonia, uh, the extended CBAs only exist in a couple of sectors, really. So it's much of a non-issue here. And even in such sectors, which include healthcare and transportation at the moment, according to the recent Supreme Court practice, they cannot really be extended to the employers who are not parties to the same agreements. So I know there's some initiative to change the law uh, in this regard, but let's say for the time being, the collective uh, agreement remains a non-issue really. Okay, thank you. So, um, Annie, if we can now move to the next slide or next topic. Um, are the allowances, um, allowances, cost allowances, reimbursements of expenses was a very important uh, topic when uh, the revised posted workers directive uh, was being uh, discussed. And uh, two things have uh, been added uh, compared to the 96 uh, directive. So first of all, the question uh, whether the employer must pay uh, for travel, board and lodging uh, for the travel from the home country to the host country is not something uh, which must be assessed according to host country law, but it must be assessed according to home country law. And as I know in particular in East European countries, you have a lot of mandatory per diems and that must be paid because according to the uh, revised posted workers directive, the assessment is really to be made according to the law that applies to uh, the employment uh, contract. So what is important then um, in, in relation to allowances uh, that are being paid uh, at the occasion of a posting is always to know, can we consider these allowances to check whether we comply with our remuneration? Because if we send employees, post employees, we have to comply uh, with this concept of uh, remuneration according to the host country. So then of course the question comes, I have my remuneration, but in addition, the employee uh, gets also additional allowances per diems, et cetera. Can we take them into account in our assessment? And then it was already the case uh, in the 96 um, 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 directive that yes, you can take them into account provided that they do not cover genuine expenses such as uh, travel board and lodging. So these could never be considered, but uh, uh, other allowances which were granted at the occasion uh, of uh, the posting could be considered in your or analysis whether we meet uh, the applicable uh, remuneration uh, in the host country provided that they do not uh, cover genuine expenses. That was what we had. So what has added here now in addition is that there is a presumption that if an allowance is being granted that it covers expenses unless the employer can prove the contrary and can prove that the allowance does not cover expenses, but that it uh, constitutes general, genuine uh, remuneration, um, which should be taken into account in uh, does the, uh, the, the assessment, uh, whether the applicable remuneration is uh, being paid. So that is a, ve a very important element uh, to take into consideration uh, when you draft assignment letters, because if you want some allowances to be considered as remuneration, it is important that you document it, that it is clearly uh, mentioned in the assignment letters that, it, that they do not cover uh, expenses, but that is to be considered as genuine uh, remuneration. Um, if we make the comparison uh, in all the countries, well, it has to be said that in all countries that we have here, but it was also the case in the previous session, is that in all countries, uh, the directive has just been copy paste. So everywhere now, except in the UK, because it didn't implement it, uh, but everywhere now we have this uh, presumption that if allowances are being uh, granted, it is uh, uh, um, expenses, they cover expenses, unless if we prove the contrary. So this brings me to uh, the next uh, slide, which is the next topic. And that is actually the most, I would say, innovative uh, change uh, that has been uh, introduced uh, is the concept, which is completely new, 
of uh, the so-called long-term uh, posting. So actually what it comes down to is that we have seen that if an employee is being posted to the host country, as of day one, he can get this hardcore of minimum terms and conditions. But what have been added now is to say that, well, after 12 months, and that 12 months period can even be extended to 18 months uh, based on justified reasoning. Well, after 12 months, we will know not only apply this hardcore, uh, ex uh, this hardcore or these hardcore minimum terms and conditions, but we will apply all applicable terms and conditions of the host country. So basically what it comes down to is that after 12 months, all host country employment laws apply. So that is a very important new change that you have to take into consideration, be it that there are still two very important exceptions uh, to that rule, because what is still not applicable, or at least not according to the posted workers directive, we of course still need to be ma make our assessment whether they could not apply according to, for example, the Rome 1 regulation, but at least not according to uh, this rule, what is still excluded uh, from the posted workers directive directive are the rules uh, for uh, concluding and terminating employment contracts, which means the dismissal rules. So the dismissal rules still remain excluded out of this uh, the posted uh, workers directive, which is uh, very important. And in addition to that second exception are the rules regarding uh, supplementary uh, pension schemes. Um, what has also been introduced is to say that if, uh, for example, employers are being smart and then they just uh, change employees, but actually those employees, they do the same work in the same place, well, all the periods must be added together to see whether or not we exceed the 12 month uh, periods. So if I now go to uh, the panel, um, I'm very interesting. Uh, interested to know, uh, first of all, how this 12 months period must be calculated, because we have seen in the previous sessions that there are two positions on European level. There are countries which say, okay, we take already in account the period that the employee was in the host country before the 30th of July to see whether the 12 month period has been exceeded, yes or no. And then there are other countries who say, no, we only start counting or 12 month periods as of the 30th of July of this year, whether or not the employee was before in the country. So that is an important thing that I would like to, to have your input from. And then secondly, of course, also for our audience to know what is now in addition that we should consider after 12 months uh, that is in addition applicable compared to what was applicable before uh, the uh, 12 months. So Valeria, if you could give us some insight uh, on Italy. Well, Sophie, I have to, I, I definitely agree with you. This is a very, very relevant, a very important provision as you all uh, perceive. And I have a couple of comments. First of all, Italy implemented the directive late, later, so by the end of September. So um, this makes uh, also interpretation and comments and so on uh, more, more recent. So we don't have uh, on certain, a certain number of items, a lot of interpretations yet. Uh, and so, first of all, regarding one of your questions, when uh, the 12 months period starts running, uh, I would uh, uh, cautiously consider even before the implementation of, of the directive in Italy. So even before the 30th of September, uh, but we'll see if there is an interpretation coming out. Uh, second uh, is um, mm, another important point, as you say, and it is extremely powerful. So after 12 months, if it is 12 or 18, not only the minimum provisions would apply, but all, and they, also the translation Italian is all terms and conditions of employment let down by the laws and the collective agreement. So the entire employment legislation and the entire employment provisions coming from collective agreements, as said, not the ones uh, uh, of, at the plant level. So it's everything. So uh, we say parental leave, unpaid leave, uh, limitations on changing a person's duties, uh, but actually it is everything. And as you know, you know, Italian uh, employment legislation is uh, often uh, favorable to the employees. So this is something to consider, to take into account very seriously. 
there is a kind of debate. I think it's not even a debate. It shouldn't even be a debate. But some first commentators made a point according to which when the law says, the Italian law implemented the directive says, uh, all laws uh, applicable in Italy in employment, uh, uh, in employment uh, it should be also social security. In my opinion, it doesn't make sense uh, because we know that uh, um, social security regulation comes from you know, a European regulation in case of posting. So this is not going to be replaced by the directive or the Italian implementation on the directive. Uh, but it is a kind of dangerous uh, interpretation that we have seen and on which of course we will follow up to see if there is any uh, any more serious uh, uh, position from the ministry or the social security body. I, from my point of view, um, social security wouldn't apply because of this provision. Okay, thank you, Valeria. Then perhaps the UK. Um, nothing really <laughs> to add for the UK here. Um, the default position is that the UK thinks that UK law all aspects of UK employment law will apply. So that's the main point to remember. Thank you. Um, then Poland, next one, I guess, next slide. All right, so with regard to Poland, the period of posting that started before the implementation date counts too, but the long-term posting conditions will only start to be applicable after 18 months of posting. And what's important at this point is the fact that the justified reasoning is not required in this matter. So for example, if posting started on July the 1st, 2020, uh, we had implementation one month later. So we still can use this 17 months period and be uh, um, and delegate and send and post the employee according to this, um, to this basic conditions. And what happens next? If we, um, we can use these this basic conditions for 12 months or potentially for 18 months, if we submit the justified reasoning, and what are the provisions being applicable after 12 or 18 months? So all provisions being applicable to the local employee, except for the rules and procedures for signing and terminating employment contracts, um, applying non-compete clauses, as well as occupational pension schemes and employee capital plans. These rules will be excluded. On the top of what Sophie said a few minutes before, um, I would like to point out these main conditions and main rules of accumulation of periods. If we send the same employee to the same position, within the, the 12 or 18 months period respectively, um, we have to make sure that they do different job at this uh, place of posting place. And the three key factors how we can, uh, how we can be challenged are first of all, identity of services, um, the type of work that's carried out and the address if we have satisfied these rules, it means that the work of these two posted employees is being accumulated. Okay, thank you, Michael. Henrietta? Yes, so in Hungary, um, I think we have quite uh, a friendly rules regarding the long-term posting, uh, uh, which means that, uh, so in Hungary, only the period after the implementation of the uh, posted worker directive counts, so not the period before 30 July 2020. And uh, an extension uh, up, to the, up to 18 months is also uh, possible in Hungary. Uh, to this uh, a recent notification uh, shall be submitted to the, the competent authority in an online form. Uh, and um, regarding the, the reasoning, uh, the criteria uh, are not defined yet by the, the law. And uh, it's also still unclear uh, whether the authorities may refuse uh, the extension or this is an uh, automatic uh, extension. So based on the wording, um, uh, 
I, I would say uh, that the, the latter one is correct, that this should be an automatic uh, extension. Uh, and uh, after the uh, 12 or 18 uh, months, uh, with some exceptions, uh, uh, the Hungarian labor code uh, shall apply to, to all uh, posted workers in Hungary. Okay, thank you. And then Estonia? Yes, uh, in Estonia, um, the calculation of the 12 month period uh, starts from 30 July and anything before that does not count towards the 12 months. And after the, the 12 months, um, all Estonian employment regulations apply. So that would in practice mean, for example, parental leaves, uh, employer funded trainings, uh, so limitations to liability for damages. Um, so basically everything except for the things excluded by the directive. So this would be the termination on complete clauses and the occupational pension schemes would be excluded. Okay, thank you. So now we have still two uh, but minor um, areas. So um, the next one is the information duty that as such is not that new because it's something which was already included in a previous uh, directive and which imposes uh, member states to make sure that they provide on their websites information for uh, companies and employers so that they exactly know what uh, obligations they have if they post uh, workers uh, to uh, their uh, countries. So, and that they exactly know what are the conditions that they should apply as of day one and what in addition comes uh, on top of it uh, after 12 uh, months. So perhaps um, I would, it's something uh, which was provided in an era directive. What is new is that now the revised posted workers uh, directive uh, uh, recalls this, but also says that um, in case of non-compliance, the fact whether or not uh, uh, the, 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 the mandatory obligations uh, are being mentioned on the website is an element that should be taken into account when determining uh, the penalty. So actually it comes down to that according to the directive, member states should make sure to provide sufficient information. And if that is not the case, that that could then be considered as a mitigating uh, uh, circumstance. So this is why I um, would like to know from uh, the panel uh, how far uh, it is in or what the status of that website is in their uh, jurisdictions. Uh, Valeria? Yeah, I would say that uh, it's quite good. Uh, of course, uh, for the last directive, it was not, it is not yet updated because as I said, it entered into force at the end of September. Uh, but still, I have to say that this is a very practical point, and I see that in managing specific cases of uh, secondments to other countries, clients really enjoy, let's say, the fact of being able to go into the website and find, uh, in, uh, in particular, the, the, the terms and conditions that uh, would, uh, would be applicable. So this is an important tool, and uh, the update from the new directive is also very important, I think. UK, same answer, but we will have some time for UK afterwards. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, the UK has not complied with this one. Poland, you have them, I see. Yeah, we have up to the information that is available on the web page of National Labor Inspectorate that runs this uh, web page. By the way, uh, National Labor Inspectorate is also the authority that has to be informed about. Uh, any changes in posting. Okay. And I think it's the same for Hungary and Estonia that we have. Yes, yes. Hungary also complies uh, with this uh, information obligation. So uh, we have all relevant information uh, available on the website of the Ministry for Innovation and Technology. And also the Estonian information is available in the website of the Labour Inspectorate, both in Estonian and English. Okay. Very good to know. Um, so then we come to the last uh, topic, which is uh, temporary agency uh, workers. Perhaps if we can move to the next slide. Yes. Um, so two things that have 
been included. Um, first of all, uh, the equal treatment principle, which is a principle which applies to temporary agency workers compared to local workers. It's also something which was included uh, in an earlier directive. Now it also says that countries must also apply that principle to foreign uh, temporary agency workers which are being posted uh, from abroad. And then in another thing that has been introduced is that if a user company uh, uses a foreign uh, temporary uh, agency worker that the user company, so the client, uh, must provide information on the applicable terms and conditions as we have seen them in uh, the previous slides uh, to um, the temporary agency uh, in, in advance. Um, any comments from the countries from Italy? Well, very quickly, uh, just to say that we have uh, the provision in the Italian implementation and it was just a kind of split the, the, the scenario into the different situations where the, is the user in another country sending uh, the employee to Italy or is the, the user in Italy sending the employee to another country. But the principle is the same and the obligation of information remains. Okay, Poland. We have a very similar, a very broad notion of the employer um, after implementation of the directive. So uh, also the temporary agencies must comply with all the rules with regard to posting. And obviously user companies must inform these agencies in writing of the terms and conditions applicable to the posted um, employees, uh, including um, if it posts employee to another member state. Okay, and I think next one is Hungary. Any comments from Hungary in relation to the new obligations? Yes, just very briefly. Um, so uh, the um, we have information uh, obligation um, once, uh, uh, regarding uh, to the, the authority. Uh, so uh, I would just add that uh, uh, the uh, uh, posting uh, shall be notified uh, to the authority, which uh, can be made uh, in an online form. So with uh, filling in uh, an online form and uh, which can be uh, submitted uh, uh, on the website uh, of the, the ministry. And uh, what important is the timing. So uh, uh, this form must be submitted before the posted worker starts working and all uh, second months shall be notified regardless the, the length uh, uh, of the second month. And there is an uh, information obligation also towards the foreign employers, uh, which must be made in a written form, uh, which is very important uh, because uh, this uh, uh, should be uh, provable. Uh, the risk is uh, if the performance of the uh, information obligation is not provable is that the host employer may be liable uh, for the claims of the uh, employees. And um, as to the, the fines, uh, there is an administrative fine uh, for the, uh, uh, so uh, which can be uh, imposed uh, against uh, the foreign employer uh, if uh, the employer uh, doesn't comply uh, with, the, uh, with the rules uh, of, of, uh, uh, regarding the posted workers. Okay, thank you. And then last one, Estonia, any comments? Yeah. No, not really, it's the same in Estonia. So that's the information requirement and the same rules apply as to um, posted workers. And I did not forget the UK, but for once the UK has made a change here from the revised posted workers directive. So I have allocated an entire slide to the UK. So next one is Abby. Yeah, this is our moment of glory here. Um, so we, um, yeah, we have implemented this one, but basically it's just the same information requirements where the hirer um, or end user of the temporary agency worker has, um, and where they're going to post that agency worker to an EEA country, they need to provide the agency with information about that posting. And that's really it. Um, in any event, uh, these um, regulations are going to expire on the 31st of December, 2020. So I think we can conclude that the impact of this, um, this legislation is going to be almost uh, zero. It's gonna be negligible. Okay, but because it is it is almost zero, then I'm very curious to know what we should know, what will apply after 
the 31st of uh, December. So Annie, if you can move to the next slide, because now we have you here, I wanna know uh, if I'm considering sending my employees to uh, the UK as of the 1st of January, what should I take into account as potential changes and what should I do? Yeah, so- um, Perhaps the so, next slide, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, so um, in terms of strict employment law, well, we obviously don't know um, whether a deal is going to be reached. Last week I thought there was, there was no deal and now there might be a deal and we just don't know. We just wait for waiting for Boris to let us know. But in any event, um, if no arrangement is reached, it's likely that the posted workers directive will no longer apply. But as I said before, the UK actually didn't implement the posted workers directive anyway, because it considers that domestic law already provides the, the required protection. So actually, from the UK perspective, uh, for any workers coming to the UK, um, not much will change in that respect. And UK law is, is still going to apply uh, for all intents and purposes. Um, on social security and immigration, um, obviously these are considerations for any company sending an employee to the UK. And um, these uh, fare less well, I suppose. Um, on Social Security, it does really depend on whether a deal is reached before the 31st of December 2020. Um, if a deal is reached, it seems likely that the current EU Social Security rules are likely to continue to apply. Um, if there's no deal, um, the current rules will no longer apply and the position will need to be determined, by, be determined by agreement between the UK and each member state. So from a UK perspective, it seems that existing A1 certificates will continue to be honoured. Um, but for new postings, it is going to depend on the agreement reached between the, relevant, between the countries. Um, but it is possible that there could be social security due both in the UK and the host country. So I think we really just have to, as we have been doing for quite some time, just wait, wait and see. Um, so that always seems to be the answer in these uh, situations. Um, so on immigration, so as you'll probably be aware, free movement for EEA and Swiss nationals um, to the UK is ending at 11 p.m. on the 31st of December, 2020. Um, EEA and Swiss nationals who arrive by the 31st of December are allowed to enter, reside and work under retained free, move, free movement arrangements and family members can join them. And that's under the EU settlement scheme. Um, and as you can see, there's uh, that uh, people must apply under that by the 30th of June, 2021. There are going to be new immigration rules which will apply from the 1st of January 2021. And this is going to apply equally to EEA and non-EEA nationals. Um, and really the main way that EU nationals will be able to work in the UK will be with sponsorship from an employer. Um, so obviously this is an issue because there, there will be more companies that need to start applying for sponsorship licenses um, to continue uh, to employ EU nationals. Okay, thank you, Abby. And I think we are we have gone through our, our presentation. Um, I'm gonna look at some questions. Um, okay. So perhaps Valeria, I have here one uh, for Italy, which is that um, the rules if. Um, people are being seconded from outside Europe to Italy. Do the rules also apply uh, from the, the posted workers directive rules in Italy? Do they also apply if we are dealing with non-EU uh, postings? You're on, on, you have to unmute yourself. Too polite. <laughs> <laughs> Even when I speak, I remain mute. <laughs> so. Um, yes, it is a very good question because um, uh, when we think about directives, so we think about European uh, members, EU member states. So we think of secondments uh, within uh, EU members. Uh, but actually, since the very first implementation of the directive, uh, 
uh, Italy has uh, implemented also the concept that even if a, an, an employee is being seconded from outside uh, EU, is going to benefit, he or she is going to benefit from the same provisions, uh, as a matter of fact. And this is not uh, uh, something original from Italy, it's something that is uh, kind of stated also in the directive, so non-EU members shouldn't benefit from a more favorable treatment than EU members, but I seem to understand that this is not the case for all the jurisdictions, so it is important, it is something to really keep in mind, so even if you are posting someone from the US, from a non-EU member, you need to take into account that if it is secondment, and this is another very important point to, to assess, if it is secondment, these provisions would apply. And actually, we have a second question, which says that, as I'm reading it, which country applied the Posted Workers Directive for workers traveling from outside the EU? Um, I must say, I don't know all the countries by heart, but I think the principle is that the Posted Workers Directive, as Valeria said, that um, employees from outside Europe should not, or empl their employers actually should not receive a more favorable treatment. Um, but perhaps, and now I'm going to Heli, I understood, for example, that in Estonia, they did not implement it in that way. So that is actually why you should always check according to the relevant uh, legislation. I do not know, Heli, if you want to add something to that. Yeah, the Estonian uh, Implementation Act of the Posted Workers Directive does not make any reference to equal treatment of the posted employees coming from the third country, so to say. So it's actually a question of how they should be treated and whether the directive has been implemented correctly in Estonia. So at the moment, no, it's only to EU and EA. Um, and then I also have another question for the UK, whether you already know what social security agreements will be in place. Um, so, yeah, so the, the UK has some old bilateral agreements, um, which were agreed prior to uh, the EU rules. Um, and I, I believe they have them with a few EU, um, EU countries such as Belgium, Germany and France. Um, but unfortunately, these are quite old and they're quite outdated. And it's uh, it's not really clear if they're, um, you know, the legal status of those agreements isn't really very clear. Um, so I think it's very likely that for new assignments, it's, you know, unless an agreement is reached, then a new agreement is going to have to be negotiated uh, between each country. So I believe there is um, an agreement with Ireland so far, but... Um, I don't think there are any with any other countries. Yeah, just to add, we have one with uh, Belgium, an old one, but the position is that it will no longer apply. That is from, from a Belgian perspective. So we need a new one. Um, and then I also have a question for Poland uh, to know what formal obligations need to be complied with when um, employees are being posted to uh, Poland. Well, so in other words, it's a question about the recipe uh, for a lawful posting. So just to clearly, just to uh, fulfill the formal obligations and the most important is the fact that we have to provide appropriate uh, working conditions to the posted employee. And uh, the other duties are to notify, to inform the labor inspectorate that I mentioned before, that's the body responsible for dealing with posting in Poland and to notify them about our posted employee. And we also have to notify the authority about any changes in posting, as well as uh, submit the notion if you want to, currently if you want to extend the posting over um, 12 months. Um, besides, I can mention that we also have to, as a foreign employer, maintain the documents related to the posted employee. Uh, it could be either electronic or paper form. And that's pretty all. Okay, and then I take one other question for Hungary um, to know what, what happens if the, uh, the laws of the home country are more favorable than the Hungarian ones, and in, in particular in relation to the 12 month periods, um, what, what should employers apply then? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. This is a, a very good question because, uh, uh, so within the uh, 12 months, uh, uh, period. It's quite clear, it's regulated uh, by the law that uh, the uh, more favorable law shall apply. Uh, and uh, 
uh, I uh, think uh, that uh, the principle is the same even after the 12 months. So the, the rules which are more favorable for the posted workers uh, are applicable. Uh, however, uh, this principle is not, uh, uh, not uh, set out in the labor code. Okay, then I see that it is exactly one minute before two. So um, we are very happy to be in time. Thank you for the panel for respecting uh, our time uh, periods. And uh, then I want to thank uh, everybody for uh, joining us. And I hope uh, you find it very uh, interesting and have learned something. And I can only wish you a very, very nice uh, weekend. And uh, Annie, um, I hand back to you. Thank you, Sophie. So for any questions that you might have, the presenters will remain available by email, and I'm sure they will be very, to, very happy to answer those. Then for further information on immigration and global mobility issues, I recommend that you visit our Youth Labores website, where you can find different updates covering several countries. And for more information on, on our webinars, you can visit our webinar page where we keep all the recordings and the slide decks for all past webinars. And finally, me too, I would like to thank everyone for attending and thanks also to our presenters for their insights. So with that, this webinar will now be ending. Thank you.